Over to you, James. Thank you. Um, so the paper that this is based on is called Private Summation in the Multi-Message Shuffle Model. I'm only going to be talking about the half of that paper that he thought would be of most interest to an MPC audience. Um, I'll start by introducing differential privacy and explaining what the shuffle model is. Um, this is really just to give background for why we're interested in revisiting this paper called Cryptography via Anonymity by Ishai et al. Um, and then I'll explain what we've, how we've built on their work, which is really a question of doing secure addition in this uh, anonymity, an anonymous channels model. Okay, so firstly, you should recognize this from the previous talk if you were paying attention. Um, differential privacy, we have some data analysis pipeline, we have a data set which has someone's personal data in it, and we want the output of this analysis pipeline to not leak too much about them. Uh, and the way we're going to formalize this is we're going to have another pipe, or do the same analysis on a different data set, which is the same as the first, except one person's data has been changed. I've been replaced by Elmo here. And we want to ask that an adversary can't really tell between these two situations. Uh, and of course, if these two outputs were indistinguishable, then that would mean that nothing about me was being learned. Now, unfortunately, if they're indistinguishable for every pair, uh, for every replacing, then nothing about me is being learned, I'm contributing no information, and then no one's contributing any information, and so we can't learn anything from the output, so that's, that's too much to ask, we can't get utility in that case. So differential privacy instead says that the outputs must satisfy this equation, which basically just says that the probability of the output being in any fixed set can't change too much between these two scenarios, that the likelihood ratio of being in one scenario rather than the other is bounded by e to the epsilon. And you should think of this plus delta on the end as being cryptographically small. OK, so that's differential privacy in the curator model. Now, um, there's another model of differential privacy called the local model. And the difference between these two cases is that in the curator model, we were uh, trusting all of the database to some trusted curator who was then going to compute something. And we were merely asking that the output be secure. Uh, be private, sorry. In the local model, we instead ask each uh, person to randomize their data locally so that it's already differentially private before they send it into any centralized database. Uh, the local model is better because you don't have to trust anyone outside of your own machine to look after your data, but it's also worse because, at least on the question of um, real valued summation. So this is summing values in the interval 0, 1. Uh, with n users, we find that in the local model, it's known that you need to incur error at least square root n, whereas in the curator model, we can get constant error. And the shuffle model has kind of been proposed as something which is intermediate between these two, uh, an attempt to get pretty close to the best of both worlds. And the idea here is that each person randomizes their data and then sends it to a shuffler who will shuffle all the messages together and then send them on to the analyzer. So this, you do have to trust that a sufficient fraction of the other people, of the other users will send their data in and you have to trust that without telling the adversary what they're sending in or how they've randomized it. And you have to trust that they are, um, and you have to trust the shuffler to work. Uh, so there's a question, how do we implement this shuffler? Uh, this could be with MPC or with trusted hardware or with a mixed net. For the purposes of this talk, we're quite um, agnostic as to how it's implemented, but there are papers out there discussing, I mean, there's a huge literature on mixed nets and there are papers discussing how to use trusted hardware to do shuffling in an efficient way. And there are also forthcoming papers discussing how to do it with MPC. Um, so there are, there are ways to implement shuffling. Okay, so then the question is, does this actually give us good accuracy? Do we gain something over the local model by having this shuffling going on? And last year's TPMPC, I presented a paper in which we showed that we do. In fact, if you're allowed to put one piece of paper into the hat, one message in that's gonna be shuffled, then um, you get error n to the power of sixth is optimal. And can be achieved with log n, with a message, single message of size log n. Uh, Chiu et al. showed that if you have 
multiple messages. So this is each person is able to write multiple or multiple pieces of paper and put all of these pieces of paper into the hat. And then the hat will be shaken and the adversary will look inside. So in particular, the messages from one party won't be linked to each other. Um, then you can get constant error. Uh, however, this requires square root n messages, which is quite a lot of communication. And so this leaves open the question of how much communication do we actually need in order to get this constant error? Also, this Chiratol error, it's, it's sort of constant, but it's an order of magnitude or two more than uh, that which you can get in the curator model. Uh, so there's still uh, improvement to be made on the error there as well. And the way that this protocol is going to work, we're going to, unsurprisingly, it is possible to beat that, and I'm going to show you how to beat it. And it's going to work by first using anonymous channels to do addition, and this allows us to simulate a trusted adder. You know, anonymous channels and shuffling, you can think of as, as the same thing. If you have anonymous channels, well, one way of formalizing that is to say that the messages that are going in are gonna be shuffled. Um, and then once we have this trusted adder, we're going to uh, do differential privacy on top of that, show how to use this to get differential privacy with very good accuracy. So let me first do the second of those things, and then I can stop talking about differential privacy for the rest of the talk, and we can just talk about secure addition with anonymous channels. Okay, so our inputs are real numbers. So the first thing we're going to have to do is discretize them. Uh, so we're going to round them in a randomized way so that the, there's no bias in how they're rounded to some precision. Uh, and the precision we're going to call P. Uh, and then we're going to add some noise to each of the random variables in such a way that when you add them all up, the sum of the noises hides the error. Um, and you might think you want to do something Gaussian-like, maybe a binomial. It actually turns out that you want to use the difference of two negative binomials because when you add loads of these things together, you get a Laplace distribution. And if you know about differential privacy, you'll recognize the Laplace distribution as being a good distribution to add on top of numbers that have been added up in order to provide differential privacy. And so you won't be surprised that we're getting accuracy very close to the curator model. Uh, if you don't, you don't need to worry about it. The only point here really is that people are all adding noise and when they all add together, they get differential privacy. The other point I want to make at this point is that this P uh, we can choose it to be square root n, and that's precise enough to get us curator model accuracy. Um, so p only needs to be n to the power of half. And then, yeah, I now want to stop and ask, what have we actually asked of this trusted adder? Is it doing addition in the integers, or in the integers modulo what? You know, um, and if we have n values, each between zero and p, then we only need to add values up to p n, p n plus one really, but p n. Ish. So that's n to the power 3 over 2. So we need to be able to do addition modulo n to the power 3 over 2 uh, using anonymous channels. Okay, no more differential privacy. I'll move on to how to do addition from shuffling. And the protocol we're going to use isn't new. It was, it appeared in a paper in 2006 by Ishayatal called uh, Cryptography from Anonymity. And it goes like this. We have our users, each one has a number. We're going to add these numbers up, modulo nine. Uh, they're going to start by additively sharing their values into a bunch of shares, six in this case. And then they're going to shove all of those shares into the hat and it's gonna be shaken around and the adversary is just going to receive effectively the, the multi-set of uh, additive shares that people put in. And the adversary just then takes all of those shares, adds them together and gets the answer. Let this protocol is correct, I think is pretty clear to anyone who understands how additive secret sharing works. So I won't say any more about correctness. Uh, the difficult part is proving that this protocol is secure. And in particular, we want to show that if you have two different data sets, X and Y, that add up to the same amount, then the view of the adversary is going to be, or the distribution of the view of the adversary on each of those data sets is the same up to some statistical distance of at most two to the minus sigma, where sigma is a security parameter. So this is the kind of guarantee we're providing. And Ishai et al were able to do this. They were able to prove that if you take M to be at least this amount here, um, we had to 
they didn't do all the constants, they just showed all the log n worked. But uh, if you take the constant through, it comes out like this. Um, and it turns out that this is an order log n expression or sigma plus log n because q is just n to the three over two. So log q is log n, or order log n. And if we put these parameters I have in this corner over here in, then we get um, m equals 89. Okay, so the, their original proof would have required 89 messages in this situation. But there's something odd about this expression, which is that the number of messages you have to put in is growing with n. If you think about it, when you've got this hat, if you put a certain number of messages, so you take your input, you split it into a bunch of shares, you put them all in the hat, and a bunch of other people do, and then it, you're told that there are going to be more people coming in, and they're all going to put shares in as well. This should make you more secure, not less. And that's not entirely trivial because in order to have statistical security, we have to protect everyone simultaneously and there are more people to protect, but you might still intuitively feel like it should, um, the situation should improve as N grows, not get worse. And indeed it actually does. This growing with N is an artifact of the proof uh, Ishai et al. used. It's not an artifact of their protocol. So there are, sorry, I'm, yeah, getting confused about the order of my slides. Uh, the point is that here they've shown that if you take m to be order log n, then that works. So we can say if you have order log n messages of size order log n, then you get curator model error. There's something odd about this formula. You shouldn't expect it to grow with n. Um, and indeed it doesn't. Uh, so in our work, we showed that this M suffices, which comes out as M equals 14. Meanwhile, in concurrent work, Ghazi et al showed that at least if Q is prime, then the correct order is this order, which is the same as our order. So they've shown a lower bound, which says that we're both within a constant of the truth. And they also showed an upper bound of that same order. Um, they didn't, however, pull the constants through their proof. Uh, we tried to pull the constants through their proof and were able to come up with solid numbers that worked, but we weren't able to make them very small. And we don't know to what extent that's just because they weren't trying to optimize constants or to what extent it's a, a matter of how their proof works, you know, something that's fundamental to their proof. But at any rate, they didn't provide the constants. Um, and if you drag the numbers through here, you get M to be some three digit number so it's worse than the Ishaya et al. result in practice. Okay, and that means that we can get away with all big O1 messages. 14 messages would suffice for the situation I just showed you and give you big O1 error. Right. Um, and this is big O1 of the same order. As, it's, it's not just the same order as the curator model. It's within a factor of two of the curator model. Uh, rather than within a factor of 100 for practical values of epsilon. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'm now going to try and explain to you why this protocol is secure and how we were able to show that it was secure with such a small number of shares. The first step of the proof is going to be to take one share from each of these secret shared values and send it to the adversary. And the purpose of this one share, as far as the proof is concerned, is just to make it so that what remains is doing the protocol with one fewer shares per user, but with an input that is typical. And in fact, the proof goes through even if these three values, or these val one value from each user that are sent to the adversary are sent in the clear. Um, the only thing we're going to use them for is making sure that the uh, inputs that we then try to add together using the other shares don't have some special structure that will mess us up. We can assume that they're typical of the, from the space of uh, n values in ZQ. Okay, so we have typical inputs and at the expense of one share. Now, we want to show that if you have two databases that add up to the same amount, here are our two databases, that the view of the adversary on one database is almost indistinguishable from the view of the adversary on the other database. 
is indistinguishable up to statistical security. Um, and the way we're going to do that is to show that if we have one database, then the resulting set of shares that the adversary receives is basically uniformly selected from the uh, possible ordered lists of shares that have the correct sum. So let me first just write down how many there are. There are Q to the NM possible lists of shares. One in Q of them, i.e. this many, will have the correct sum. And so the probability of being any one of those values should be Q to the one minus N times M. And what we're actually going to show is that the probability of being any of those one values is less than or equal to Q to the one minus NM multiplied by one plus two to the minus sigma. So this is our statistical security guarantee. Okay, and the way we're going to show that is we're going to say if I if we have two independent uh, implement uh, runs of the protocol, the view of the adversary in the first one and the view of adversary in the second one have a probability of being equal that is less than or equal to the probability of them being any one value multiplied by one plus two to the minus two sigma, and this implies that this is just saying. Um, really, it's because the uniform distribution minimizes your probability of two independent runs ending up on the same value. And so it suffices to prove this upper statement in order to get the lower one. OK, so we now have two runs of the protocol running on different values. Uh, sorry, running with the same inputs, but with different randomness. Um, OK. So what does this consist of? Well, each from each side, we're going to split the numbers into shares, which is what the colored arrows represent. And then both sides are going to be shuffled and we'll end up with these pairs of black arrows in the middle. And V is going to be equal to V primed if and only if for every pair of black arrow heads, the number coming from the left is equal to the number coming from the right. Okay, but there's no need to think of two separate permutations here. If you look at the arrow from the middle blue on the left to the lower green on the right. These two arrows meet up here. So we're going to replace them both with just a line that runs from that middle green, middle blue to the lower green. And this event is going to be that the value at that middle green, blue, sorry, the value at that middle blue on the left is equal to the value at the lower green on the right. And now comes the bit where I think this is, is probably the main trick of the proof really, is that we're going to use the fact that we have these uh, typical inputs. What we've basically said so far is that if we select these inputs, or what we're trying to prove is that if we select these inputs at random and then secret share them and then shuffle them, then we get this nice event happening. But we don't have to think about those random things happening in that order. We could first choose the permutation, i.e. the black lines in the middle, and then choose the shares, and then have the shares determine the things on the outside and ask what's the probability that this event happens. And this probability is not going to change when we consider these things in the opposite order. So let me get rid of those values from the outside and imagine that we fix this permutation in the middle. So we're conditioning on this permutation and asking conditioned on that, what's the probability that we have this event happening. Well, that's the probability that the, so we're going to consider each black line in turn, starting uh, in the order that they appear on the left-hand side of the picture. And the probability that the first black line has the same value at the left and the right is going to be one over Q. And we're then going to ask, what's the probability that the next black line has the same value on the left and the right, conditioned on the first value? I'm uh, um, sorry, conditioned on the first line having the same value at the left and the right. And we'll find that that's also one over Q. And as we go down all of these arrowheads, uh, each time asking conditioned on all of the previous ones, having matching the corresponding arrow on the other side, what's the probability that this one will also match the corresponding arrow on the other side? And we'll find that as we go down all of them for this particular permutation that you're currently looking at, the answer will always be one over Q until you get to the bottom when something different happens because we're enforcing that the sum of the inputs on the left-hand side is equal to the sum of the inputs on the right. So if 
um, all but one of the black lines has the same value at each side, then the final black line must also have the same value at each side. And so as there are n m shares in total, n users, m shares for each, the probability um, of all of these things happening is one over q raised to the power n m minus the one from the end, which is q to the one minus n m. So the probability of this event happening conditioned on this permutation is exactly q to the one minus n m, even without this error on the end. OK, so I said that that was the case for this permutation. What can go wrong? Well, the thing that can go wrong is that if your permutation doesn't link all the users together, we can try and do the same argument as last time. But we'll find that when we get down to this final blue arrow, um, because the sum of the green and the blue person must be the same on the left as on the right, once we've seen that all of these first five arrow, uh, black lines have the same amount on the left as on the right, then this sixth one must as well. And so we only get, we don't get a contribution of one over Q from here. And again, the same as last time, we don't get a contribution of one over Q from here, from the bottom, from either the bottom blue or the bottom red. And so the final probability is Q to the two minus NM. But this is the only way it can go wrong. And so in order to understand, um, in order to understand this error, to bound it as less than two to the minus two sigma, we need to look at the probability of there being, hang on, let me just say, you can think here of there being a graph where the vertices are the users and the edges are these black lines. So it's, it's gonna be a multi-graph with uh, self loops. And this thing that goes wrong, it can go wrong if this graph fails to be connected. So we have some random graph model here and we want to know whether or not it's connected. And if you're familiar with, uh, the connectedness properties of random graphs, then you would probably suspect that the way in which things can go wrong is if there is some isolated vertex, some vertex that is only connected to itself. And indeed, that is by far the most likely thing to go wrong. It's not going to happen that a thousand of the users over here are all connected to each other and a thousand of the users over here are all connected to each other, but there are no connections between them, you know, if you have 2000 users in total. That basically never happens. It's ridiculously unlikely. And so hand waving away the lower order terms, we can just look at the probability of there being isolated vertices and how damaging that is. Okay, so this expression here, the N is the number of users. So this is the number of vertices that could possibly be isolated. The probability of each one being isolated is about one over N to the M, which is because they have M shares and each one has a one in N chance of connecting to that same user. Again, I'm sweeping lower order terms away. And when, so this is the n times one over n to the m is the probability of this bad thing happening. And when that happens, as you can see on this slide, the probability came out q times bigger than it should be. And so uh, we need this q times that probability to be less than the two to the minus two sigma that you see at the bottom of this slide. Okay, so that's this expression. The thing on the left needs to be less than or equal to the thing on the right. So if we set them equal uh, and then solve for M, then we get this expression for M. And this tells us how many shares we needed. The, remember there was one share at the beginning that we spent in order to get the typical inputs that we needed. And so we need to add that back in, changing this plus one to a plus two. And there's also the lower order terms that I waved away and they show up again, can show up again in the form of this constant that is being subtracted from the denominator. So we end up with log in the base two of n minus some constant, which is less than one and a half. E is just Euler's number. Um, there's nothing particularly special about this number. This constant can definitely be made smaller than this. But when I was working on that, my co-authors told me that rather than optimizing the constants of lower order terms, I should instead get a life. So um, this is all you're getting. Uh, I hope you understood some of that. And thank you for listening. Great, there's advice for everyone in the audience. Don't worry about low order terms, get a life. Okay, we have one quick question. Um, is a, a question from Antigone. Um, in practice, what do you propose to use to achieve anonymous communications? Is it something like Tor or whatever? Um, Tor is one possibility, certainly. Um, 
we have been doing some work on, on ways of doing this in MPC uh, and of ways of making mixed net like ideas be more rigorous and trying to figure out how efficient that is. Uh, there are also, I think, a lot of people who are interested in this kind of model from uh, a very practical security viewpoint. Uh, I remember giving a talk on this and on this shuffle model and someone asking, so you know, someone from Facebook asking, whether it was okay to, or whether this would provide a guarantee if they just collected all the data and then stripped off the metadata and forgot it, would the resulting database then be differentially private? And indeed it would be. Um, so it provides, you know, whilst you have to trust the central authority to strip the metadata off there, it also provides a way of guaranteeing that something is secure there. Obviously for addition, that's not very useful. And I suspect for most of these things, for most of these implementations, it's not going to be the most efficient way of doing addition in that model. Okay, cool. Right, we'll leave it there. Um, thank you very much. Another round of applause.